Good evening everybody and welcome to tonight's MHPN webinar. Um, it's been a tricky day or week or month for lots of us today, but I hope uh, what we're bringing you tonight will be of help. I'd like to welcome the over 660 participants we have so far uh, joining us tonight live and those that might be watching the webinar at another time. First of all, the MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to Elders past, present and future for the memories, traditions, the culture, hopes and cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So hello everybody, I'm Nicola Palfrey, I'm a clinical psychologist and director of the Child Trauma Network at the ANU. Um, I'm glad to have you all along tonight for this really important topic. There's been a huge amount of interest and it's amazing to see how many of you are online tonight given everything else that's going on in our world today. So we are uh, experiencing an unprecedented situation at the moment with the COVID-19 panic and you might be distracted from tonight's webinar as lots of us have been making quick alterations to our lives. But I'd like you to take a moment, if you can, to focus on what we're doing tonight. Step away from your distractions, if you can. If that's not possible, and we completely understand that, don't worry, this will be recorded and you'll be able to watch it at any time that suits you in the future. So the purpose of this webinar is to give health professionals the skills that they need so they can more effectively help people in the future. Personal stories of illness are of course really important to the work we all do and MHPN often include consumers and carers on our panel. The chat box is a chance for you to connect with other people but we do ask you not to share your personal stories in this forum. It's designed to complement the panel and allow discussion for professionals to connect with each other, share resources and experiences of practice. So I really thank you for respecting that tonight. If any of the content in tonight's webinar causes distress, please seek care for yourself if you require it from Beyond Blue at 1300 226636 or contact your local GP or mental health service. So tonight's webinar is covering suicidality in adults. I know there's a lot of interest from the hundreds and hundreds of questions that we've got before the webinar about other uh, client groups, um, including children and other vulnerable populations. There's actually a host of other webinars in the MH MHPN uh, library that you can access on those topics, and they're listed in the resources at the end of the webinar. Okay, so let's get going. Um, you will have had a chance to see the bios of the panellists with material that's been sent out, so we're not going to go through that in any detail because we want to get into it tonight. We are not sure if Dr Graham Fleming is going to be able to join us. We hope he can, but I'm sure you can all understand given he is a GP in a rural location, he may well be caught up um, at the moment, so we will see if he's able to join us. If not, we will work with the two fantastic panellists I'm already have. here. Oh, Graham, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I said okay. like. <laughs> no, I'm in, but I'm in now. Yeah, um, no. Graham, not giving you a moment to catch your breath. Um, I'll come <laughs> back to you in, in two seconds. I'll throw some questions okay, to our other fine. panelists to give you a chance to, to catch your breath. So I'm wondering, um, Tim, if I can start with you. You work in the ED of hospitals and have done for a long time and you've yep. worked with lots of people who present uh, with thoughts of suicide, um, either suicide attempts or self-harm. What do you think are the preferred approaches for responding clinically to those sorts of presentations? Um, yeah, I think with, with me it's all about a sense of connected, connectedness and engagement and um, you know, I hope we can talk about that um, at length when we have our, our open discussion today, but um, yeah, we, we've done four studies now um, with um, calling people who have attended the emergency department uh, and seen a mental health nurse in the ED. And the common theme that comes out of the four studies we've conducted is the therapeutic value that people derive from being listened to and understood. It's as simple as that. Fantastic. Yeah, and I hope we can dig into that today because I think that's a really yep. important point. Um, Dr. Lynn O'Grady is also joining us from Victoria. Welcome, Lynn. Um, Lynn, you've recently moved back to private practice. I was wondering how that might have impacted your understanding of working with clients who were suicidal, given you've worked in this area in both clinical and uh, research spheres for a long time. 
Yeah, thanks, Nicola. I have just in the last few months returned to doing some private practice work or some direct work with clients, and I've done a lot of writing and um, study and training in the area of suicidality. So it's been um, really good to get back to the to closer to the ground, and I guess it, it's put me back into a space of, of the, having to deal with the issues that that many of the people I've been working with um, are dealing with. So um, private practice is is a pretty challenging space and really challenging at the moment and what that looks like in terms of someone who presents with suicidality can be, it can be a, a very big responsibility and can feel a little bit overwhelming at times but drawing on the things that we're going to be talking about tonight I think can help us to, to feel more confident and, and to be effective in, in that space. Fantastic. I think that's a really important part of the discussion we're going to have tonight. Thank you. And Dr. Graham Fleming, welcome. Uh, so glad you could join us. Um, as I mentioned, Graham, you work in a rural area. Um, are there any particular challenges or approaches that you use in this space? Yeah, I've got three essential principles I always go by. The first is rapport, and the second is rapport, and the third is rapport. <laughs> So at the end of the interview, I need to know that the patient left knowing that I know how bad they felt and that together we can find a solution. Fantastic. Okay, great. I look forward to hearing more about that as we go along. So just the last bit of housekeeping before I be quiet and we actually can get on with the rest of the content. For those of you joining us, there's navigating around the platform that you're joining us in on. There's a chat box that we invite you, as I mentioned before, to enter uh, your comments, uh, sharing resources or ideas with your colleagues that are joining us tonight. If you have a question, there's a hand button for help. Uh, the slides and resources will be available and they're available for download from the download button. And if you need help, the, the lovely people at Redback will help you out um, with any technical issues and so forth. So as we go through tonight, each of our panellists are going to give a short-ish five or to seven minute presentation based on their work and their area of expertise. And then we will be opening it up for Q&A. We've had, as I said, hundreds if not thousands of questions already come through. Um, we'll take some as they come through tonight and we'll hopefully have a, bit, uh, a, a really productive conversation at the end of it. So tonight, for the learning outcomes for today, very quickly, we want to define the concept of risk and known factors associated with increased risk of suicide. We want to identify the needs of a person, very importantly experiencing suicidality, including assessment, risk formulation, safety planning and ongoing monitoring. And then lastly, identify the importance of appropriate referrals and collaboration with other professionals with, when working with a person experiencing suicidality. Okay, so let's get going. We've already had the case of Nathan sent out to you, so hopefully all of you have had a chance to go through that. Um, so we won't go over that again. So I'm now going to throw over to Graham in your own time to take us through your perspective. Thanks. Okay, so um, one of the things that um, uh, we, we need to know is that suicidal thoughts are very common. And we all have them. They're often transient and even recurrent. Sometimes we're in an embarrassing situation. We wish we could turn into a heap of dust and blow out underneath the door. And uh, sometimes um, uh, we just feel life's just too hard and we really would like to escape. But most of us can put that off. But when these thoughts become constant rumination, intractable or intrusive suicidal thoughts, this calls for a, a mental health assessment of well-being and function. The suicidal red flag on top of the iceberg of emotional and mental problems is a triad of symptoms of insomnia, lethargy and feeling cheesed off or as I like to say pissed off which people identify. doesn't matter who they are as soon as you mention pissed off they know exactly what we're talking about. So there are in actual fact three main components for people to get to a suicidal thinking. The first one is a, uh, a sense of uh, object hopelessness and despair. The second one is there's a delusion that suicide is the only or the best or the easiest option. And thirdly, a determination to die. And sometimes we've got to remember that people's brains are switched down and they're feeling lethargic and they can't really get themselves organised. The big risk comes as they start to improve when motivation improves before the negative thoughts start to lift. Now, I'd like to address um, some of the things on the um, 
uh, of that that first slide, the uh, sense of abject hopelessness, and I come back to the the, the fact that the most important thing um, uh, is rapport. And if we, you don't establish rapport with an adolescent, you might as well refer them on to somebody else. Rapport is critically important that people know uh, how they feel. The next thing we need to do is, uh, because the sense of abject uh, hopelessness and despair is there, we need to provide hope. We congratulate, uh, congratulate them on making the first step and opening up about their feelings and we can commiserate with them how bad they feel. And the next step is to, to promise them support. It's no good saying to them, oh, things aren't that bad, because in their brain, things are that bad. And if you minimise their feelings, they'll think you don't understand. Um, but what I'd explain to them is under uh, conditions of extreme stress or long-standing chronic distress, the brain shuts down and the mind is consumed by negative thinking. And although they cannot see solutions, there are always solutions, and together we will discover them together. The second thing I want to do is provide support. In a case of a broken leg, you would at least organise pain relief, crutches and a physio until all is well. And it's no different from mental health. When the brain is actually shut down or as it were broken, you will stand by them until the appropriate counsellors or financial counsellors or psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, and in this case, uh, Nathan's already found help with a clinical psychologist and we need to support him in continuing to do that and the GP can help to facilitate that as time goes by. The third thing we need to do is provide resources. Uh, resources, uh, uh, the protective factor is already present. He's got his sister who he can confine with. He's got parents, although the parents are a little bit standard offish, but obviously they care. And where Nathan was concerned when he, his parents found him committing suicide, he actually responded to, to their concern. We'd also point out and give him the list of numbers of Lifeline and other in, uh, institutions around. For me, it's uh, uh, my number uh, that I'm available. Uh, the hospital in rural areas are always trained to accept people. There's headspace for ad adolescents. We can refer them to the Black, <coughs> Beyond Blue and the Black Dog on, on the internet that they can go and three, uh, search through that. Sometimes we come across difficult and transient patients and we have to explain you have a duty of care to keep them safe and uh, you're going to stand by them uh, until uh, a solution or something is happening. Slide three. Sorry, in your case, it is slide, uh, no, slide six. Um one of the things I want to uh, point out to uh, Nathan is that severe and acute stress or chronic stress causes the brain to shut down to such an extent that they um, can't actually think through things as, as well as they would when the brain was working properly. I explained to them the brain shuts down because the neurotransmitters uh, cause a whole range of symptoms, which I'll explain to you in the following model. The brain needs to be retrained how to develop new strategies and the psychologist is well um, positioned to do that. Uh, for long-standing chronic stress or family history of mental problems, medication can often be used to help switch the brain back on a bit more quickly. I use this occasion also to warn people about triggers which can make matters worse. In Nathan's case, this was uh, a nasty email uh, that he got from his girlfriend who told him to back off. It was really just a small straw that breaks the camel's back. We need to uh, point out to him that you know, over the background of things not going so well for him in a while, this was just another thing that happened. The other big problem uh, is alcohol. Alcohol is in itself a depressant and a very powerful depressant at that and it also um, causes people to dissociate or... Um, do things that they wouldn't do under normal circumstances and probably 50 to 80 percent of suicides in this country have alcohol on board. The fourth thing I want to do is to explain uh, my uh, slide uh, with the model on it and the model is about nearly um, 35 years old at least and the only new things I've put on there 
or ACT and CBT and transmitters. But this is a way I explain people how the social arrangement and the psychological arrangement work together or the biological component work together. If you start with a model, in the middle of the model is a centre called the mood centre which sits in the brain. It's probably several centres. But it normally controls someone's ability to sleep. It, uh, it controls their energy. It controls um, their mood, their motivation, the poor concentration, memory, appetite, libido, socialisation, self-esteem, and um, uh, stabilises the autonomic system. That's our breathing and indigestion and heart rate. So if people's brain shuts down, they can't sleep generally, or uncommonly they'll sleep all the time, but generally early morning waking, wake, waking at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning with a racing mind, they become lethargic, uh, they feel cheesed off, down, frustrated, irritable, uh, their motivation becomes poor, their concentration becomes distractible, their memory is poor, the appetite, they can become picky eaters, uh, libido is lost, socialisation become withdrawn, the self-esteem is low, uh, and uh, the autonomic system starts going haywire, they get headaches, dry mouth, aching muscles, chest pain, palpitations, abdominal pain, any, any of those sort of things. And if you have a look at the model, it says that when those symptoms happen, you have chronic stress. Now, chronic stress is also known to shut the brain down, as will chronic illness, chronic pain, uh, some medical illnesses, particularly thyroid disease, drugs such as an uh, alcohol, cannabis, um, can all help switch the mood down. <clears throat> and now we can see a cycle which explains the downhill spiral that people get as the stress starts to uh, shut their brain down and it becomes a very quick downhill spiral till they feel as though they're in a deep pit that they can't get out of. Things that switch the brain on are exercise, good times, good mood, a couple of million dollars in a week up the width Sundays makes people feel good. Acute stress in actual fact causes a surge of transmitters in the short term, but then they blow out and chronic stress comes in and that shuts the mood center down very quickly. Counseling, psychotherapy are helping, and you'll also see on there CBT, ADT as well. The um, final thing that I need to point out is the risks uh, associated um, with uh, suicidal thinking. Is often the suicidal thinking can come on exceedingly quickly without warning, and. Um, I've seen this happen many, many times. I don't know if anybody knows the story about Danny Frawley. I was at a meeting with him in Clare, and uh, he presented a very good picture of suicidal thinking, what, whatever. He knew exactly what was going on. Uh, he knew exactly all about it, and he explained to the people, a thousand people in that town all that day, all about it, and yet he still managed to go off his medication, didn't pick uh, the signs, and neither did the... Um, uh, chairman of the uh, uh, Department of Psychiatry at Adelaide University who also committed suicide. So this can happen very, very rapidly. And for that reason, we need to be watching um, uh, Nathan very closely as a GP. And even though he's seeing the psychologist, the GP need, probably needs to, to uh, see him every couple of weeks or a couple of times a week in the early stages to monitor the um, situation. Um, the, um, I think uh, that's about all. Um, it's really Great. important, I think. Yep. So we might leave it there, Graham, because we want to leave some time yep. for a bit more conversation yep, at sorry. the end. So yep. thank you okay. yep. so much for yep. that. I'm going to pass over to Tim to have a um, take us through his slides and his perspective. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thanks, Nicola. Thank you all for um, chiming in tonight. It's uh, great to see so many people on the list. I appreciate your time in, in these troublesome times. Um, before we talk about therapeutic approaches in the open discussion, I was going to focus mainly on um, risk assessment practices, which. Um, at least in my experience in the public health system, I've been working in emergency for 20 years now. Um, there seems to be still a lot of faith placed in risk assessment practices such as tick box uh, risk assessments, risk assessment scales and, and risk stratification. Um, but I think this provides a, a false sense of security. Like um, Graham said, I think 
think uh, it's important for us to view suicidal thoughts as a normal response to what are often very abnormal circumstances. And so suicidal thoughts are very common. Uh, the act of suicide is statistically rare, which makes the job for us of anticipating who will go on to end their lives extraordinarily difficult. Um, research that I read indicates that um, there is no evidence that a focus on risk, risk factors, such as whether someone has a plans or means for suicide, has any impact on circumventing suicide. And there's no evidence to support the clinical utility of categorising people as high, medium or low risk of suicide. 95% um, of people who are so-called high risk of suicide don't go on to end their lives and the majority of people who do um, end their lives by suicide are in the low risk category. Um, so the, even the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists in the um, guidelines on self-harm have uh, suggested that any form of risk stratification is not warranted for determining follow-up. Uh, so in the case of Nathan, we see that the GP referred Nathan to the psychologist with, with the um, idea that he was at, at medium risk of suicide. And I think, well, how, how, do we, how do we determine whether someone's at medium risk of suicide? How do you make that call? Where do you draw the line? And for how long do you consider someone to be at medium risk? What's the use-by date on that, um, uh, that determination? And as Graham alluded to as well, risk fluctuates dramatically. People can be acutely suicidal one minute and an hour or so later that risk can be uh, significantly diminished. Um, the Australian Commission for Healthcare Safety and Quality recently published the Comprehensive Care Standard and uh, that process involved a, a ma massive scoping review of risk assessment management and practices across the whole of health, not just mental health, but uh, falls, pressure injuries, uh, all, all aspects of health. But the, um, the Commission determined that there's no really well-validated screening tools for suicide risk uh, and no evidence that such tools are able to accurately predict suicide risk. Uh, the, the comprehensive care standard also suggests that risk screening assessment have become a formality and that uh, at least a really a, you know, this over-duplication of risk screening and assessment processes and poor patient experience. Oh, what's happened there? Um, some of you might have seen the UN Special Reporter um, um, uh, re press release uh, in October 2019, which was uh, around suicide prevention for the uh, World Mental Health Day. Um, and the, the points raised in that press release was that um, there's insufficient support for screening. A um, large percentage of uh, suicides are actually not planned, but impulsive gestures. And we need to consider the context in which people often experience suicidal thoughts, such as drug and alcohol problems, trauma, loss, relationship issues, stress. Uh, they all uh, compound the risk for suicide. Um, and there's this growing body of evidence indicating that an over-reliance on um, pharmacological uh, approaches, uh, hospitalisation uh, for suicidality uh, might be counterproductive and lead to an increase in suicide risk. Uh, where we should be focusing our attention on um, having conversations with people on how to transform their lives uh, and how to recover from these kind of situations. So Tim, can I just get mind... you to refresh your skin, Tim? Sorry, it's Nicola here. Your oh. screen's gone black, so if you could try and refresh. Ah, doing Sorry. it right now. <laughs> yeah. I know. Can I still be it's heard? Bit... We can, yes. It's the whole of Australia yeah, okay. is on the, on the internet, I think, at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, hard. fighting against Netflix, something. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. How's that? Can't see at the moment, so we might you keep going, and we'll see um, if the tech guys can help us out. Yeah, I can see you guys. Um, look, I'm up to my last slide anyway, and, and that's mainly about, um, I think it's really important for people like Nathan is, is to really uh, acknowledge the distress of the situation uh, and how this has uh, caused him great distress, to normalise um, the situation without minimising it, so it's an understandable response to a really challenging situation. And with people like Nathan, I'm often saying, well, how willing are you to explore options other than suicide? Yeah, let's talk about options other than suicide, uh, about self-care, not self-destruction, um, being connected with the world, not isolating yourself from the world, 
um, ways that people can maintain their health and well-being and, and ways of keeping safe. I have discussions with people all the time on how will you be maintaining your safety when you leave the emergency department. And I think people should always leave interaction with a health professional uh, with some hope that things will improve. Great. I think you've got one more slide. No, I'm going to Lynn. Thank you. No, Mary. I haven't. I'm sorry. Things are working against us today, but we've got your face back. Thank you so much, Jim. Lynn's turn. Um, I appreciate everybody's patience. I know things are being a bit tricky this evening. Um, hopefully for the second half, things will go a bit more smoothly. So now let's hand over to Lynn from your perspective as a community psychologist. Thank you, Lynn. Right. Thanks, Nicola. And hi, everyone. Good to, good to be here. I guess I, when I was looking at this planning for this, tonight's presentation, I was putting myself in the shoes of being the psychologist that Nathan's been referred to by the GP, because that is something that I'm doing these days. And we know that it's really important to hear the stories, to hear the person's story, not go through a, a checklist of, of things to answer and, and just to tick them off. We're actually wanting to hear the story. We're wanting to understand what some of the concerns might be, what some of the risks might be at the moment. Um, how, the, how the client's thinking about the experience that they've been through, having a suicide attempt is, is major and we want to try and understand that as well. But of course we've only got a short time, a period of time to do that and we need to make some pretty big decisions in that time. So what I'd be trying to do is I listen to Nathan's story and building the rapport, building that relationship and taking it seriously as we've heard about already, is to trying to pluck out some of, the, some of the most important factors. And I'd be thinking about the risk and protective factors that we know about. They're at a population health model in terms of population level that we talk about in terms of the framework. But I'm still plucking them out to make sense of them. So we, we know some of the things that have happened to him recently. We also know how he's feeling at the moment. He's losing interest in his life. He's, he's feeling like he's hit rock bottom. He's 30. He's moved back after 10 years to live with his parents. He has support from his sister, but he's concerned about that in terms of the kind of role model he is for his, for his um, niece, nephews. And he's worried about his, what people are saying about him and his masculinity and how he sees himself. So there's a lot going on in terms of shame and, and working out who he is and that loss of identity and all of this. We know that there's a historical um, aspect to his personality around impulsivity, that he's, he's had long-standing issues um, with impulsivity and risk-taking, although he hasn't had previous suicide attempts or, or efforts to, to actually harm himself, but we know impulsivity is one of the, the issues that we'd be concerned about, and it really taps into what we're talking about in terms of being able to predict what people are going to do when they leave our office, and we, we really, really don't know. So impulsivity is a concern. Alcohol is also a concern. Um, but the shame and the feeling, the feeling haunted in terms of nightmares is, is something I, th I think is um, interesting and something we don't hear much about in terms of the trauma following the suicide attempt. There's not a lot of research or writing about that at the moment. Um, so there's, there's lots going on for Nathan. So we really wanted to build that relationship, give him a chance to talk about what he's experiencing and then gathering this information through that process. And, we, and as I said before, as in working in private practice, you only have this short period of time and you may have other clients lining up outside. So you have to manage this and be able to pull out with confidence the most important features of the story. One of the things that I thought was really important and, and through some of the training and some of the work that done with um, consultants and consultancy with working with and training with other mental health professionals is our confidence around this is, um, is not great, I guess. So I've plucked out some of the things that I'd be thinking about as a psychologist sitting in the, in the room with Nathan. I'd be having lots of these thoughts that are probably a bit panicky potentially and a bit unhelpful in terms of feeling confident and giving that confidence to Nathan that, and the hope to Nathan that we're going to be able to work through this, we're going to be able to come up with some, some ideas and, and help him going away feeling, feeling heard and hopefully with some hope. So there's a lot that you're trying to do in this short time. So some of the things are listed there in terms of some of these typical kinds of thoughts that I've heard people talk about and I've experienced myself. So the whole question around risk, is he at risk? And of course he is and we can't talk about the level, but we do need to identify what, we, what we're going to do in terms of his needs at this time. So we need to be doing some kind of assessment. There would be an expectation that we have questions that we've asked and that we have documented. So it's really important that we are assessing what's going on for him at this point in time. We also need to recognise that he probably won't be telling us everything, that we know that clients can come and see a mental health practitioner or another health practitioner and not tell um, them everything. And I certainly have clients who come to me now and, and tell me in the third session around their suicidality or their thoughts that they have from time to time. And they, they didn't tell me that in the first session and they weren't necessarily at that 
having high, high concerns around that, but it's something that's there for some people. So they won't always tell us everything straight away. We have to build the trust before they can do that. So we have to expect that there's perhaps some other things going on that we don't know about. I might be questioning whether I'm the best person. I, I would be wondering about that, but I'm the person in the room at the time. So I'm the only person that can do something at that time. And I need to be really feeling that I can actually do something to, to be helping him and, and to not, not let you give in to that hopeless kind of feeling that I can sometimes be feeling when, when see, I know the stakes are pretty high here. We don't always deal with life and death when we're, we're studying psychology. It's not something we talk about very much. So I really need to be aware that um, this is something I need to, to be able to stick with. I need to have a level of comfort with it and trust myself and trust the process of safety planning and gathering the information and building a relationship that's actually going to enable us to, to be able to work together. I'm going to be feeling like I might have missed something. That's one of the things I, I hear about all the time and I can I appreciate that. Could I have done something else? Did I do everything? Did I miss something? And we have to learn to be able to sit with this and, and that's, that's quite challenging. One of the ways that we can kind of use or I guess a model that can help us is risk formulation. This comes from um, some, a paper that came out in 2015 by Pisani and some others with the references there and new resources. And this is a way I guess that we would formulate all that information that we're gathering. So bearing in mind we've got this short time, we're getting the story, we're getting lots of information. Some of it is to do with, with risk, some of it is to do with protective factors, some of it is static sort of risks that, that is there that we can't actually do much about and some of them are of our more recent risks that we might be able to work with. We're looking at the, the status in terms of what's actually going on for this person compared to other people. We know that being a male, being impulsive, um, relationship breakdown, these are some of the things that we hear about that, that create a, a real concern for us. But we're also hearing some of the protective things that are possibly there and some of the things that, that might be okay, but we want to build on those and we want to be really working towards what else can we add into the mix what are the available resources that we haven't perhaps tapped into yet that we might want to want to do that. And we might want to get a bit more information so that we do understand and check that we're not missing some of the most important things that, that might be um, important for us to know. Importantly, we need to understand what matters most to him. And some of that's going to come through in the story that he's told us. Some of it's going to come through in the things that he's lost. He's the loss of identity, the loss of this relationship and the way that that, that, that happened is devastating for him and devastating to his sense of who he is and that shame that, that he's feeling about this whole process. So we, we can unpack that in a, in a way that helps us to understand well, what is important to him and how can, he, how can he still see some of the things that are important? How can he reclaim some of those things? And it might be through the conversation with him and asking some of those prompting questions that, that don't dismiss how he's feeling but help him to perhaps re-look re at things again because they're the things that we want to be building in. We want to recognise the importance of family and friends. We know that he's, he's living at, back at home again and we, we know that the parents, you know, that's quite a challenge for him. Um, they are there. Mum's pretty impacted by what she's seen and we, we need to make sure that they're getting proper support as well. So Beyond Blue do have a book that's available to download, which is really important, but we, we do need to do some more work in terms of supporting family and friends because even if you engage as well with with a mental health professional and comes to appointments, he's still going home and he's going to be with, with his family and hopefully with his friends. So they need to know what to do as well so they don't un unintentionally do anything that can be damaging or harmful, but also that they have, have some support around what is a really difficult time. So we need to do some more work around that, but that, that resource is available. And finally, the best tool that we have or the best thing that we can do is, is to really focus on safety planning. And Beyond Blue also have an app that's available online called Beyond Now and it's based on the safety planning work that, that Stanley and Brown did in 2012. So it has a, has a reasonably solid evidence base. Some of it's been looked at in, in emergency departments with, um, with different populations, but it's the best we've got at the moment. So it's really focusing on pulling out all of the information that we're getting through the story and incorporating it into a safety plan that's done collaboratively with the clients. And this is what can help us to manage that, have we done enough? Have we put some things in place? And this is a plan that we could be sending the client away with and then re-look at again next time they come back. And if they don't come back, at least they've got something. Because that's the other thing that, that happens. People who have had suicide attempts and are coming, and we know for Nathan he came because his parents kind of told him he should, we may not, may not come, he may not want to come back and say, have another time to talk about this, this stuff if he doesn't want to. So we're giving him something at least to go away with 
and all the information we've been gathering, this is a place for us to put it, put it there and to work with him to, to develop up a reasonable plan around some of the, the triggers, some of the, any of the means that he had talked about, making sure that he's um, got some um, reduced access to those. It's difficult to get rid of all means, but for someone who's impulsive, it's really, really important that there's distance between him and his thinking and him accessing means to, to harm himself, so that's really important. Talking about alcohol will be really important. We know alcohol comes up in the data now. The um, Australian Bureau of Statistics has data looking at psychosocial factors and some of the other information we haven't had before, and alcohol comes up there. So there's lots of, lots of things that we can flag with Nathan. There are lots of things that we can help him recognise and we can draw on some of the ways that he's coped, help him to recognise some of the supports that he might have, the people that do care about him that perhaps he hasn't identified yet, people that would want to know and be there for him if he's going through a difficult time. And then, of course, the phone numbers that we've already talked about as well, so that there's always someone there. If it's not someone directly, it's someone on the phone line. So really important messages for him to go away with a plan and some hope that, that comes with that, that that's really important that can be built upon. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, now we've got uh, a nice amount of time to have a Q&A with our panellists. I've got lots of questions coming through. As I said, I've got hundreds that came in before the webinar. But one of the things I might throw to you first, Tim, if I can, um, yep. I think one of the things that came to you very strongly in the questions before tonight, and I think will be in people's minds tonight, is can you help us make the distinction between risk, risk assessment and safety planning and what that actually looks like when you're sitting across somebody um, such as Nathan? Yeah, well, um, kind of as, as Lynn alluded to, you know, we, we consider risk factors, but um, the... Uh, emphasis should be really on addressing individual needs, um, assessing what people's needs are and being collaborative, as Lynn said, in terms of coming up with a plan of of what what are the next steps. Um, so I think um, you know, risk assessment um, is a little bit more uh, mechanical, whereas uh, you know, safety planning and needs assessment is, is more collaborative and uh, is working with the person. Fantastic, thank you. And Graham, are you still on the line with us? Yeah, I'm still on the line, yes. Hi, Graham. I was wondering if, well, this is a question actually for all three of you, but I thought we might start with you, Graham, and talk a little bit about the process and the interactions that people like a multidisciplinary team, such as yourselves, how you might work together. So if you were the GP in this picture, how would you see yourself liaising with someone like Tim in the emergency uh, department and, and Lynn as the treating psychologist? What's the kind of relationship that you think works well in terms of uh, yeah, working collaboratively for the best results? Well, in actual fact, in a rural area, you don't have access to a psychologist. You may have a, uh, access to a uh, counsellor, but that doesn't occur very often either. Um, mm -hmm. I probably would relate to again to a psychiatrist but it's going to take you three to six months to get an appointment um, basically what I can't handle um, doesn't get done um, I, I do send people off to psychologists but again um, I'll send them off with a referral letter and then three to six months later I'll get a letter back saying um, what what they've done Normally, I send uh, people off to psychologists uh, to do some intensive ACT or CBT therapy, um, and I guess that's going on. And I'll come back with a report later on. But from rural areas, it's very difficult to access anybody else. And that was what I said in the beginning. Um, I've got to really establish a good relationship with people first off, so they keep coming back, and uh, I, I can continue providing support. Um, it's really difficult to access. Uh, nobody in the regional hospitals mm. want to know about them. It, it, it is difficult. And Graham, just picking up on that, when you say, how do you get somebody to come back? Are there particular things that you have found more success with in terms of engaging people that you know, well, people are often reluctant to come back? As I said in the beginning, um, I really worked very hard at establishing rapport at the beginning and really saying that I... Uh, I understand how bad they feel. I want to help them get better, and I usually ex explain in, in terms of the model um, how we're going to work to get things back together again and how we're going to switch the brain on. 
And I tell them that a lot of them got a broken leg, uh, their brain isn't working properly and we need to get that working properly. And I use mm-hmm. those nine things like poor self-esteem um, and uh, no, not sleeping, lethargy. These are all signs that the brain just isn't working properly and we need to switch that back on by whatever means we can. I do psychotherapy as well and I use bits and pieces, pieces of, of CBT, but in the time frame I've got, I don't have an hour to spend with patients. Yeah. Um, but I'll okay. need that. Thank you, Graham. What about um, Tim? I was wondering if you might be able to weigh in there. It's, um, yeah. it's just around that collaborating with other other practitioners. How does that work for you, given how busy you are in that in your clinical role? No, it, it's fine. I mean, we often have people who are sent in by their private psychologist or GP into an ED for. Um, for an assessment of someone's um, safety, and that's okay. You know, I, I tell patients all the time that the ED is not a necessarily a comfortable place, but it's a it's a, it's a safe place, and uh, you, you know we we never close. Uh, you're welcome back any time if you if you don't feel safe. Uh, I also think there's a real emphasis on us being um, you know, therapeutically positive with people uh, in that collaborative way, um, sending people the message that, you know, we will work with you to fix this. And, um, and I think therapeutic optimism is very powerful. Uh, and, uh, and that's what people are often looking for is some reassurance that, um, with the right kind of support that this can be beaten. Graham's right though, outside of the, the metropolitan centers, the resources for people in mental distress sort of taper off quite drastically. Mm-hmm. Same with drug and alcohol services. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's our biggest challenge is how to meet the needs of people in more um, regional and rural areas. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions about that as well, but I might just throw to you, mm. Lynn, if, if you don't mind, about the interactions in your experience and the importance of interactions between general practitioners and, and other practitioners when working with somebody who may be experiencing suicidality. Yeah, I think it's really crucial, and it comes to that point around being the only, feeling like you're the only person that, that's there and that weight of responsibility and, um, I guess, the privilege that people come and talk to you about it but it also can feel feel like a huge responsibility so feeling like you're sharing that with the GP and I work in two practices in Melbourne metropolitan areas and um, have, I'm still developing because I'm still quite new to, to the role but developing relationships with GPs and um, getting referrals and being able to um, have some conversations and reporting back to GPs so I'm looking to to do that some more. I've also had some experiences in terms of people when they have used their safety plan and have gone to an emergency department, which would be one of one of those um, those suggestions on there, and have had some contacts in the emergency department on discharge that, to let me know that they've been there. So the client has said that, that I'm their treating practitioner and then I can follow up, even if I'm not planning to see them for a little while, I can at least follow up with a phone call and have, have a conversation and check where things are at and what else we might need to do. And if there's anything else we need to put in place would be one of the things that, that I'd be um, wanting to talk about. So it's, I think it's crucial that we do work as, as part of a team. I, I just feel like we don't always have enough, even in the metropolitan areas, we don't have enough options. So if somebody is um, you know, critically um, in need and, and we, through our conversations, you know, if Nathan was, was saying that he did have some, you know, some intent and, and wasn't going to be able to be safe and keep himself safe, well then you, you would need to put something in place, I mean a CAT team or emergency department but if you know if the other sort of extreme of that, that that there's no immediate need or you know it's, it's not something that you can feel like you can do that with um, apart from the safety plan there's, there's not a lot of other support that's there at the moment and I know around the country there's various models and pilots and things happening and cafes and things like that for people to go to as an alternative to the emergency department but some emergency departments won't won't see people who, who turn up and, and um, and need to have you know some support around their suicidality, so they can get mm-hmm. shunted off to other hospitals as well. So there's there's significant gaps in the system still, despite what we've known, and despite knowing this for a really really long time, and despite a lot of funding and a lot of um, talk, and you know knowing we need to do some things differently. You can also feel you know a bit isolated in terms of um, doing this work. So it is important that we we connect and have good peer consultation, supervision, people that we can talk to and, and good planning for ourselves to, um, to look after ourselves in this space and try to collaborate wherever we, we can, I, I think it's really important. 
Okay, thank you, Lynn. I'm going to pick up on a couple of those points. I'm not sure, um, Graeme, if you're happy if you, to chat about this or if either of the other panellists have experienced There's been a couple of questions from Wesley and also from Sarah around the role of telehealth and what role that might be able to play in supporting people who may be struggling with thoughts of suicide. Have either yeah. of you, or any of the yeah, panellists, have any experience? Yeah. Yep. We That's use true. telehealth quite a bit. Um, basically, we use it for acute patients that are um, not so much uh, suicidal, but as I say, suicide is really the top of the iceberg of an un underlying uh, emotional disorder. And sometimes uh, we will use a, a psychiatrist, either from an adolescent children's psychiatrist or an adult psychiatrist, and uh, they will spend an hour teleconferencing with a patient. More often than not, I'll sit in on them, but if I'm consulting, got other things to do, we get a nurse to sit on them. And that is a very useful thing to do. Often they'll give, give me a different perspective of where I could be going or where I should be going. The problem is that the next time you ring up, it may be a different psychiatrist seeing mm -hmm. the same patient. So that becomes problematic as well. But um, um, it, no, it, it is a very good medium, but it's mm -hmm. not as good as face-to-face. Yeah, no. But the, the difficulty is that face to face. Well, we, none of us can do face to face. But in the, the uh, foreseeable future, or to a much lesser extent, so we're going to have to keep being creative as people's pressures increase. Um, I wanted to touch on something Lynn brought up, and I think uh, maybe Tim, I'll throw to you first, and then over to Lynn, around the impact of this work on clinicians themselves. Uh, there is a lot of risk holding that uh, clinicians do, um, a lot of anxiety around doing the right thing as Lynn mentioned. Tim, have you got any advice or tips to share around self-care and what's really important for practitioners to have in place when they're working in this area? Yeah, it's a really important issue, isn't it? And uh, I think Lynn and Graham have addressed that too, with it, you know, being uh, isolated practitioners in, in um, private practice mm -hmm. or in GP clinics, you can often feel like you're carrying a fairly heavy burden of, of risk on your shoulders and it's, and it's quite understandable that you'd want to um, have another opinion to, to and people to share that risk with you. So I think in terms of self-care, you know, I, well, I, I always um, say in, um, that um, we're not mind readers and uh, lie detectors or fortune tellers and there's only so much we can do to kind of mm. keep people safe. Um, in my work with people is on emphasising the need for people to keep themselves safe and that's not taking away my responsibility but it's emphasising that I, I can't follow people around all day to keep them safe. And um, you know, so I think that in some ways we've got to realise that we, we can't... Um, control the uncontrollable uh, but uh, we also need to really t take extra effort to care for ourselves and uh, ensure that um, we, we have appropriate supervision or opportunities to um, discuss um, certain situations or scenarios with a, with a colleague um, uh, that we have you know, supports in place through, through professional networks like this um, mm -hmm. to, to discuss this, this, this heavy issue. Okay. Thanks. Lynn, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, look, I was just reminded of um, a, a day workshop that I did last year, which was held by Living Works, and it was called the Suicide to Hope Program. And a fair bit of the, that was about um, the practitioner thinking some of this stuff through. So, like I said earlier, we don't tend to um, think about um, doing psychology or other mental health work as being life and death in the way that a nurse or a, a doctor might. Um, so this training actually got us to think about what are our perspectives around this and what are, what are our own experiences of, of death and experiences that we might have had in terms of um, suicide and, and um, understanding where that might come from. So I think there's a place for, for more of that kind of training and, and probably being built into to actual um, you know, coursework rather than having to do it later on. But I, I think there's a real need for that that we actually sit with some of this and then can feel, feel really um, a little bit more prepared for that and ready to, to hear the stories and to be able to sit with it. So there's a lot of sitting with it. There's a lot of sort of trust that things are going to be okay. And I agree about putting the responsibility with the, with the client in terms of how they're going to keep themselves 
safe, but of course we're we're in that space, and if something doesn't go right, then we'll be called upon to to answer what we did. So I think another important part of it is the documentation, and that we can actually justify the decision that we made. So we are needing to be able to document well to show that we have asked questions and it means not shying away from a question around um, whether a person is, is feeling suicidal, whether or not they have had suicide attempts or other times when they've, they've thought about it. We don't know what shifts people from a thought around suicide, which we've said is, is very common, into an act and then actually dying by suicide. There's studies trying to understand that and of course there's no simple answer. It's um, very complex and multidimensional. So trying to understand it is difficult. But as long as we can document that we've actually been through a process of asking the questions, documenting what we did and then the decision making process that we went through and the steps that we took and the safety planning and the advising anybody else or keeping in contact with, with people if we need to, then I, I guess we can take some confidence that we, we have done all that we can and that is a really important um, kind of feeling, I guess, to be able to, to sleep at night or to, to feel that we have done the best best that we can and to have supervision and talk to people about it and talk it through. And, and that's some of the work that I've done with people has been just hearing that and, and for them to get to a point as a practitioner, they feel like, well, I, I did do those things and I, I have done it and I keep learning and I, you know, these are these kind of feelings that we have can, can drive us to keep learning about it. It's one of the drivers, I guess, for me to, to study um, suicidology and, and to keep learning about it and keep reading about it because it is something we need to, we need to keep learning and understanding and trying to continue to do better. Thanks, Lynn. I think it's a really good point. I mean, I think we all chips off the tongue very quickly that we need supervision and you know, note-taking is important and those sorts of things. But I think sometimes it's worth pausing, as you have done now, to say that, that the reason it's important to document it also can... It's obviously, it's a requirement we also need to have um, that containment in place. Sorry, my dog wanted to go out. <laughs> um, we've had a number of questions about working with patients that have chronic suicidal thoughts. I was wondering if anybody wanted to take that up and see if there's a different approach to somebody who may have been or does continue to struggle with thoughts of suicide on and off for, for often years and years at a time. Graham, have you got any thoughts on is the approach any different or are there strategies that um, kick in there? Is that different from chronic depression? What's the crossover of some of the questions coming through? Um, I think um, one of the things you'd be looking for is why they're getting these recurrent thoughts and uh, some people just tend to be focused on recurrent thoughts. It might not be suicide, it might be something else, uh, it might be their mother-in-law or uh, could be anything. Um, I think you get to a stage where once people start uh, using uh, suicide, and often people use it as a manipulative tool as well, um, you just uh, try and deal with the underlying mental situation that's going on at the present time tend not to worry too much about the suicidal thoughts except to tell me that there's still a lot of problems underneath that top of that iceberg that we need to get to and deal with. And sometimes the psychologist is very good at uh, getting down to the bottom of that and finding out um, what's going on on the ground. That They've got uh, more training, I guess, but they've also got... They tend to spend an hour with a patient where I'm limited to 15 or 20 minutes on this mm -hmm. Someone's desperately unwell. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lynn or Tim, do you have any other, any thoughts, uh, anything different that you do with people that you may be working with over a long period of time or, Tim, that you see a lot returning to the ED? Yeah, uh, I, I've um, known people who have been suicidal for 20 years and, uh, again, it just... Um, it's evidence of just how um, difficult our, our role is in terms of circumventing suicide. And, you know, these are people who have obviously had very challenging lives and, you know, we have to accept that people hold life in, in, with different value than, than, than we might and that it's kind of understandable that people would contemplate ending their lives if they've had pretty difficult lives from the time it started. And as with Lynn said, with documentation, I'd be documenting those kind of things that, you know, this person constitutes a long-term risk of suicide given the, the traumatic and uh, adverse life they've had. Um, so I'm often 
documents and those sort of things. I remind them that they're welcome to return at any stage. Um, I, I often will document things like the person has, has agreed that they'd rather live than die, uh, despite how challenging their situation is. Um, but yeah, I think we have to accept there are a certain number of people who um, who carry that question of whether they want to live or die with them for, for the long term. And um, you know, I think we have to also, uh, I don't think society has accepted this, that um, the only person who can prevent a suicide is the individual contemplating it. Thank you, Tim. Lynn, I was wondering if you had anything to add in terms of working clinically with people who may be experiencing these thoughts for a long period of time. Yeah, and I think it's probably more common than what we would know or would like to think about. I, I think the other sort of consideration in addition to um, what others have said is that sometimes talking about suicide or um, sharing that can be a way of communicating distress. So it can also become a way that things are really bad and I'm now suicidal again or I had the suicidal thoughts again. So I think it's trying to understand it, understand the meaning around it and trying to understand where, where that sort of language, when it first started, you know, what, when does it come, when does it go. So even some of the narrative therapy externalising kind of stuff might be, might be one way of, of looking at it. But I think there's a risk also that we can get a bit um, thinking that this is, they're always like that, and or for some people around them, perhaps to be thinking it's attention seeking, which we, we sometimes hear. They just say it; they just want attention. And I guess you know the counter argument to that is what, what's pretty awful that people have to talk about that in terms of getting attention to get some needs met or get people to listen to them. So we sort of have to be ready for that. But I think we've still got to be ready for any changes in that. So if somebody does often talk about suicidality, we, we still need to be asking some questions of whether this is different or the same as other times because we've still got to look to see whether or not there's any, any change in that. So it's, it's quite different to a person who's first experiencing some kind of suicidal thoughts and, and mm -hmm. what that might mean. But if someone has had them forever, we can't just assume that it stays the same and that it's just, you know, they're not, not sort of at more risk than a person, more or less risk than a person who's just thought about it or was talking about it for the first time. So I think it's mm -hmm. complex. It's, again, people trying to, to study it, to look at it, to try and understand it. Um, and I think we've still got to keep doing the same work around how do we build the protective factors in, do we you know, continue to look at safety planning, um, we, we want to give the message that their life is important and that we want to help them find some ways to, to be feeling better um, within that, but they, they do have to be the ones that are working with us in that. So I, I think it's complex and, and really demanding as well for practitioners mm. doing that. Um, but to keep working at it and look for any kind of changes that are happening I think is important and to validate the feelings are real and they're, they're part of um, what's going on for the person as well when they're, when they're coming and going or getting worse at different times. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I think viewing suicidal thoughts as a, as a symptom of, dis of distress and understandable symptoms of distress is a really healthy way of working with people. And it, it, and it can be a bit habitual for suicidal thoughts to be a manifestation of people's distress. But I think and approaching that with sort of some compassion and, and, and a non-judgmental um, perspective can really can be really helpful. Thank you. I think there's a lot of questions before the webinar around that how, kind of broad. How can you tell? You know, how can you tell if somebody is really suicidal? So I think there's a lot of people there that that struggle because it's such a difficult topic to to almost try and make that distinction where what I think I'm hearing you guys saying is that we need to treat each time that somebody speaks about thoughts of ending their life or suicide or self-harm as a distinct episode and, and, and take the time as much as we can with all of our constraints to take it seriously and empathetically rather than uh, the proverbial eye rolling if we've heard it a few times before yeah. and, and wondering where it's coming from. I mean, I'm a bit upfront with people, and not 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 mm. blunt, but I'll, I'll I'll say to people, look, I'm I'm sorry, mate, but suicide isn't a bargaining tool. Um, you know, mm. it puts me in a, puts me in an uncomfortable situation if you're starting to use suicide as as, as a way of bargaining, and mm -hmm. it's not really healthy for us to have a relationship um, when 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 suicide becomes a bargaining tool. Uh, mm. You know, I want to I hope you come here because you'd rather live than die. And um, and because uh, I can be really helpful to you if that's what you want to do, um, mm. so I, I I guess I am sometimes quite 
overt in putting it out there with people who mm. who, um, who may have learnt habitual ways of, of expressing their suicidal thoughts. And, and it's not being eye-rolling or cynical. It's just about being quite mm. upfront with people that, um, you know, I'm really willing to help you, um, but I want to talk to you about life, not death. That's great. And I'm just wondering if that feeds in, Graeme, a bit about what you were speaking about earlier. Is this, you're dealing with people whose brain has somewhat closed down as you said they can't think as flexibly yep. as they can when they're not depressed so sometimes we have to be a bit more concrete or upfront in our, in our questioning or our conversations with them that not being cold or, or not being uh, not being empathetic but being a bit more pragmatic with people I'm, I'm probably by the second and third consultation with these people I'd actually go through this model with them and I Explain to them that that model. I think it works very well to mm. tell you how how um, social and psychological factors will switch the brain down, and how if you've got a mm. biological problem, it'll actually um, produce the social and psychological factors as well. And mm -hmm. patients actually appreciate that and can see that. I'm I'm quite upfront about them, and I just I actually don't use the word depression because I really see anybody with mm -hmm. depression. But I see people who are pissed off about absolutely everything, particularly adolescents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use that. Um, I, I will go straight in and say, "Look," um, and I did that uh, just uh, on Friday. I said so to somebody, "You know, your brain is shut down. It is not working properly. That's the reason you mm -hmm. can't sleep. It's the reason you haven't got any energy. It's the reason you can't get motivated." And I go through those nine things, and all of a sudden they say, oh, "You do understand me." Mm -hmm. And and then we work through, and it just depends on how switched down I think they are as to mm. whether I use some counselling or whether I'm going to use some medication. And often, if they're really badly switched down, I'll use some medication, and then when their brain is working better, I'll then you know, uh, take them further down that, that road of uh, looking at themselves and looking at, at other strategies of dealing with their brain being switched down and dealing with the negative thoughts because people who are suicidal have no capacity at all to think positively. Yep. That's great, thank you. We've just got a couple more minutes and we've now got over 1,300 participants online and I know it's been a bit tricky, so thank you all for joining. I hope you've still been able to get some of the great uh, advice and expertise that the panel are offering. Lynn, just before we wrap up, I was wondering, there's a lot of questions around inclusion of people within your patient or client's life, so family members and so forth. Have you got any tips around engaging family members or when you do it, when not to do it, when working with somebody um, who is expressing thoughts of suicide? Look, I think it's really important, but it's also really challenging. So we're in this space of having to maintain confidentiality if there's no kind of obvious um, high need at that particular point in time. I, I mentioned before the, the resource, the, the um, Beyond Blue booklet that I think is useful for people to have. But I, I think the idea of bringing people around the person, so social support is, is really, really important. And it seems a bit strange at the moment talking about that when we're talking about um, physical distancing and what that's going to look like in the future. But just as practitioners that can feel alone with their, their, their person, I was going to say young person, but any person who's suicidal can, can be feeling alone with that. So the more support we can bring around them, but, but equip them with it. And there was some research that I saw about young people in um, America that, that did show that, that young people who could identify some adults in their lives and those adults received training did a lot better than, than young people who, who couldn't um, identify any people or there weren't people around them who'd had the training. So it wasn't just identifying people that can, that can be there for you, but it was also those people knowing how best to provide support. So I think there's a lot of room to do some more work around that and to really try and help, help families know what to do because sometimes the best intentions can actually um, be unhelpful or seen as, as negative or, or not helpful to, to the person who's, who's impacted. But we have to work with within our bounds of confidentiality. We have to respect the, the person's decision in terms of who they tell, but I think we have to keep building it in in terms of the safety planning and who are the people you would talk to, who are the people that, that you would go to. So they're quite different things. Who are the people you might chat to to feel better, but who are the people you would go to when you're feeling feeling down and, and needing some help and getting closer to that risk of suicide? And then who are the helplines that you could call and how would you do that? So I think there's various layers. And I know from some of the work I do with, with psychologists working with people after suicide attempt that those people who don't have social support around them are the ones that, 
the practitioner feels stuck with and the person gets stuck with. So we, we know and we're hearing about it all the time now around social support and risks of people feeling alone. Um, so identifying family and friends who can be supportive but then knowing that we have to support them to know how to provide that support. So I, th I think there's, there's more work we have to do. But I think it's critical and I think we have to, have to get to that um, somehow and, and manage the... Um, the confidentiality um, constraints that, that are there and work with the person to help them see the benefit of it and to help them to see how we could do it together, perhaps. Great. Right. Here. Um, yes. If we a moment, one of the things I do is I discuss, particularly with adolescents, uh, parents or other people that are, that are supportive and keen, I'll actually bring them in and... Um, discuss with the adolescent or with, 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 a, with a patient what we'll discuss and what we won't discuss. And then we'll have mm -hmm. a joint discussion with the patient and the carer there. And often each knows what the other's been told. And that's a very useful way of dealing with that. It's really mm -hmm. helpful to get carers on board, I think. I was going to throw to you, Graham. actually. I was just wondering that particular challenges in small communities, rural and remote communities around uh, confidentiality, people knowing each other, do you find that that's a, a benefit or an extra challenge in in these circumstances? Uh, somewhat of a challenge. In, in my previous mm. clinic, where I've 40 years, I was known as the mental health doctor. So people coming to see me, um, the people are wondering, oh, you've got a mental health problem. Uh, and that wasn't always true. Um, mm. I'm now the solo GP, so people have no idea what they're coming, coming to see me about. So it's a bit different, but... Um, uh, I think hopefully in my towns I have made mental health uh, understandable to the community so that I don't think it's as scary and uh, uh, I don't think uh, that this state for mental health is as strong as it is in some centres. I think people are beginning to understand it and uh, be comfortable that uh, um, you know, they, some people need help and I have people, even men, rural men coming in and saying, Doctor, I'm stressed, I need some help, and that would never mm -hmm. happen 15 years mm. ago. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's hope it continues because there's a lot of people out there under a lot of stress at the moment, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So oh, It's going to get worse. Yes, financial stresses on top of mm. everything else that we've got going on. Um, while I've got you there, Graeme, I might just give you a couple of minutes and we'll sum up and reflect on what we've talked about tonight if there are a couple of key messages for the people out there watching and listening about working in this area what would you, what would it be? I think uh, the first thing is uh, as I keep saying establish a rapport, find out what the underlying problems are and find out exactly where the uh, patient is in their uh, mental health status how functional are they and those questions I ask people at tell me their functional state and then promise them solutions and keep following them up. I really don't have people coming, really don't have people coming back when I say, I want to see you in two days, I want to see you in a week, I want to see you in two weeks. If you get that uh, rapport established initially and you're going to help them through, they'll keep coming back because they want to get better too. Thank you. Tim, a couple of key points for people to take home. Yeah, like Graeme said, a, a rapport, a human-to-human -human connection, some some em empathy and understanding, but also um, a focus on people's you know abilities, their assets, their positive intentions, um, their coping skills, what's worked for them in the past, uh, and uh, and their future hopes. Thank you very much. We've got um, Lynn, a few more minutes for you to to wrap up as well. Okay, I think um, be ready that you're going to, if you're working with people, you're going to be coming across people who are at risk of suicide and um, don't be um, surprised by that and expect it and be prepared to ask the questions about it. And then trust your skills, so the listening, the rapport building and the problems that people bring that, that are leading them to suicidality are also the problems that you deal with people all the time. It's what you do if you're a mental health professional and you're doing that. So trust, trust your skills, but keep learning as well. So keep up to date, follow people we've, we've given you in the resources and some suggestions and some starting points for that. So keep talking about it, keep learning, keep keeping up to date with it. But it's something that we do need to, we do need to be ready for and be prepared um, to sit with. And hopefully tonight's given people some ideas of, of how to do that. 
Thank you, Lynn. I'm just wondering, as we wrap up, we're moving into some uncharted territory around access and mobility and connection and so forth. I was wondering, just as we finish, if either of you talked a little bit about it before about social distancing, Lynn, has anybody got any great ideas around how people can stay connected, um, checking in with, with people or comments that they're worried about as we move further away from each other physically? That's right. Last curly one into you. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I, I think we've got to um, be really valuing technology as much as it's, it's really interesting how the tide is turning. We've been, you know, a bit critical of technology and um, some of the dangers and how it's impacting, but now it's what we've got. If we think about other times or other, you know, decades, centuries ago when, when people were in situations like this, which was really a long time ago. Um, we didn't have technology. It was a very different, different life. So we know the dangers of isolation and people in quarantine. We know the dangers of loneliness and we've been hearing a lot about that. So we know there will be people at risk and people who are going to be extremely anxious. And I've been watching my interest in children. I've been watching the, the stories and the discussions around closing schools and I really worry about um, kids at home and families and the pressure on families and, and what school gives people and that, that all, all workplaces and a whole lot of places where people gather together is where we get our, our, our connections with each other and that's really important for our mental health. So there's, there's huge risks out there but we do have technology that we can probably be more creative with and really embrace and that, that's probably what will get us through as long as we, um, as we are cautious as well and um, that will be interesting just to see how, how that does play out. But, yeah, it's very, very interesting, interesting times, but pretty challenging, that's for sure. Tim or Graeme, you got any other last thoughts on that? Yeah, I think social no, I, media uh, can be helpful. Um, Twitter, yeah. for example, lots of people I see on Twitter with a history of... Um, trauma and suicidality connect via Twitter. I saw a guy last year, late last year, who um, used to do a lot of blogging. He, he, he was a guy with suicidal thoughts and he often found it really positive when people would respond to blogs that he sent out on, on this um, blog site that he was on. Found that really uh, reaffirming that people would actually take the time to respond to any of his blogs. Great. All right, we need to wrap it up now. That is... Fantastic. Thank you, everybody uh, who's dialed in and stuck with us through the technical difficulties to all the fantastic panellists that we've had. Um, there is a feedback exit survey that we would love you to complete. Um, obviously, you can let us know anything that didn't work so well, but also anything that was helpful or what else you might uh, like in future webinars. We do have a webinar webinars coming up for MHPN um, Emerging Minds, part of the National Workforce Centre that I'm a part of, um, the 23rd of April on trans and gender diverse children and their families, which will be fantastic. I've seen a lot of their resources and they're great. Uh, we have a webinar on children impacted by grief on LACE coming up as well and Aboriginal children and the effects of intergenerational trauma. So check out the MHPN schedule. We hope you can join with those. So finally, MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health professionals and share tips and resources to build pathways and engage in CPD activities. So the network meetings at the moment, however, due to the COVID-19 situation um, are mostly suspended or postponed, so please check your local networks to see what's happening with that. You can also indicate your interest in that in the exit survey. And before I close, I'd like to acknowledge people with a lived experience and carers of those with a lived experience with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation this evening. I hope you can all stay as well as you can and look out for each other. Thanks very much for coming along tonight. <laughs>